All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I, I'm uh, Otis Corbett. I'm Director of Missions of Covington Baptist Association, and this is part of a series we're calling Converse Conversations with Covenant Baptist Association. And the conversation we're having tonight deals with Christian counseling. And I have uh, three colleagues that are here tonight to help uh, me with this conversation. And this conversation, or the subject of this conversation, fits in very well with our associational strategy. Our associational strategy has four pillars. One is um, encourage and equip churches and ministers. And, and Christian counseling is a part of that ministry, as well as community missions, because a number of the people that our counselors at our association will work with are, uh, are not members of one of our churches. They're actually people in the community. And so we reach out beyond our, our churches uh, through this ministry. And then uh, we also have a ministry of uh, international missions or global missions and then mission support. So uh, two of the four pillars of our, of our strategy is, is covered by this idea of Christian counseling. And with me tonight, I have uh, Alicia Lewis and Jen Knapper. Uh, they are with Pathways Christian Counseling, and they're uh, counselors that come to our office at uh, uh, in Sanford, Covered and Bap Association office, and they see uh, clients there. And again, I have a, a colleague from the Alabama Army National Guard, Derek Smith. Uh, Derek is a chaplain and a church planter and a um, licensed professional counselor. All of these folks we have tonight are licensed uh, professional. They've gone through the training program and the education. I'll talk more about that as we go. Uh, but Derek, he, he, he has too much time on his hands because he's got three jobs, maybe four. I don't know. Uh, but he's a, he's, in, he's a National Guard chaplain. He's a church planter, pastor, and then he's also a professional counselor. So I appreciate all these and uh, really uh, enjoy uh, dealing with them and working with them. And so let me do this. Let me have a quick prayer for us, and then uh, we'll uh, start with our conversation and then um, go through some questions that I have posed to our, to our guests tonight. And I think you'll find this to be a, a really interesting and um, engaging subject. So let me pray for us, and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this night and this conversation. We thank you for those that are watching us now and who will be watching us uh, on our uh, uh, YouTube site and our website again in the future. And Father, we pray that everything that we say tonight will be useful for your kingdom as we talk about this subject of Christian counseling. And uh, I want to thank you for the privilege of working with these, uh, these three uh, servants of yours and pray your blessings on them now. So thank you for uh, this night and we pray your blessings on us and thank you for loving us in Jesus name. Amen. Um, for those who are watching on uh, live on YouTube, I mean on Facebook right now, if you have a question, please feel free to uh, text that question in. Uh, also, if you come in at later uh, in, or if you have to leave before we're finished, we're going to be uh, posting, I'm recording this video and we'll be posting it uh, in our associational uh, webpage, uh, www.covenantbaptist.org. So. What I want each of uh, our guests tonight to do for us is to introduce themselves and share their call to Christian counseling, their education, their qualifications, their experience, any details they want to share about their family, etc. cetera, and uh, uh, just to let us uh, get to know them a little better. And so I'd like to start with the lead. We're going to do this uh, by first names um, alphabetically. So uh, Al Alicia, Derek, and Jen, that keeps me knowing where I'm going next. So Alicia, if you will, go ahead and talk about your uh, call, your history, background, and, and the work that you've been doing uh, with Pathways. Okay. Am I on? Okay. Um, I'm Alicia Lewis, and I'm a licensed professional counselor with Pathways Professional Counseling. We are a family ministry of the Alabama Baptist Children's Home. We are a statewide ministry. Um, I work with um, children, teens, and adults and do diverse counseling. Um, I probably accepted the call into counseling, I would say, as a teenager. Um, I felt like God had uh, plans for me. Um, in this ministry, um, I had originally thought I would work within a larger church setting into a social services counseling concept um, in some of the larger churches they have that. Um, I went to look at 
uh, campuses and fell in love with Judson Baptist College. Um, that is where I received my undergraduate. Um, I have a degree in counseling and psychology with a minor in religion. Um, I also spent some time at Southern Baptist Seminary. I was working towards um, my master's in church social work at the time. Um, due to the a program becoming non-accredited at that time, um, I chose to move back home and uh, finish my master's degree in psychology and counseling at Troy University. Um, I am married. I have been married for 20 years. I have two children, ages 16 and 17. Um, I have a freshman in college now, so that's a challenge for me personally. Um, my other daughter is in the 11th grade. Um, my husband is a minister of music at a local church here. Um, he's been a part of that ministry for six, almost 16 years. Um, I've been with Pathways about 20 years. I've been in the ministry um, for that time in Christian counseling. I've been about 29 years in the field of counseling. I've been licensed for 26, 24 years. Um, so that tells you a little bit about me, about my background. All right, very good. So, um, and you are a licensed professional counselor with the state, so the board, what is the board in Alabama? The Alabama Board of Counselors. Okay, again, Examiners good Examiners and counseling for the Alabama right. Youth. And you've been a, a licensed counselor for how long? 24 years. 24 years. All right. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, okay. Derek, would you uh, talk about uh, yourself a little bit and let us know a little bit more about you? Sure. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor as well. I have been since 2016, maybe 15. Um, I have, um, it's really been a transitional um, thing for me. I was called to the ministry and I guess about age 18 as a freshman in college. Um, and, you know, I, at that time, the only way and where I grew up, the only way I knew to describe that was a call to preach. So um, I started serving local churches as a youth pastor, uh, filling in pulpit supply and those kinds of things. Um, became part-time uh, as a youth pastor went to uh, Southwestern Seminary and got my MDiv and then became full-time. It was at that point that I took my first full-time church um, and it became one of two that I essentially had a forced termination at it and the next one. Um, and the following church was a full-time pastorate uh, here in Alabama. And I kind of reached a, a real crossroads in terms of my ministry and at that time I had a um, my oldest daughter was a teenager and it was just a really really transition and that's when I found the National Guard um, found a way honestly we were starving you know we just were struggling to put food on the table and I joined the guard as a as a way to supplement my income um, I found it to be tremendously fulfilling because ministry was simple I could just go take care of soldiers. Um, I worked hard and folks loved me and it was just great. Um, but it was at my first chaplain course that I was introduced to what we call in the army, a family life chaplain, which is a licensed counselor who is a chaplain. It's a marriage and family therapist typically. Um, and when I heard that term, I just kind of lit up like, Wow, I'd love to do that. Um, could I say it was a call? I, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Um, I don't know that I ever thought in it, of it in terms of that because at the time it was how to provide for my family. Um, I had purposed in my heart that local church was just not where I needed to be. Maybe I don't have the right personality or temperament, um, whatever. I began to pursue uh, the uh, or to think about family life chaplaincy. Long story short, I ended up getting uh, selected for a position in the National Guard. We got one of those slots, couldn't get the training. Um, I decided to get it on my own in Jacksonville and Jacksonville State. And so I finished with a master's in uh, clinical mental health. Um, 
I also have a, a D man from New Orleans. I had finished that after I uh, joined the guard. I had uh, started it when I was a local pastor, and so I just finished it. Um, I am in private practice in Anniston. Um, have been since I start. Well, I spent about six months doing um, local mental health, and knew that was not where I needed to be. I, I, I could not really help people, in my opinion. And so I have been doing um, insurance work. I do a lot of DHR work. Um, I find it very, very fulfilling. Um, I find it very easy to be a, a minister in that context because I'm in private practice and I can kind of decide who I see. And if they don't like who I am, then I'll find them somebody that they do like. So it's very easy for me to be who I am and, and still take insurance and, and kind of bridge that gap, if you will, between the secular and the spiritual. Oh, married, three daughters, one grandson, and I'm about to be an empty nester in about six weeks. Well, uh, let me say, I've um, been empty nester for several years, and Derek, you will enjoy it. We are looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, it is nice. Very good. Very good. Uh, yeah, I say, Derek, um, uh, Derek is somebody I've worked with for um, whew, over uh, 10, 12 years in the National Guard. I appreciate him. And um, he is, um, but he's also, he talks about uh, about this idea of not being a pastor, but he's also a pastor of a church. Uh, but it's a church plant, so maybe that's maybe that's part of that mix. So anyway, it's a lot different that way than it was going into an established church. It, it can be. It can be. So, um, Jen, talk about yourself for us, please. Yes, and brother Otis, thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, my name is Jennings Napper. I go by Jen. Um, I'm also a LPC, a licensed professional counselor. Um, I have a master's in family and marriage counseling from um, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, my undergraduate degree is in psychology from Troy University. Go Trojans. Um, and I also, I've been with Pathways Professional Counseling now for four years, and I'm a co-worker um, with Alicia. Um, and as far as a calling to ministry, um, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior at a young age and, and knew that you know, there, there was a calling on my life to make disciples. And I felt like God showed, showed me that when I got to Troy and I started thinking about counseling and, you know, at a secular university and in very secular field, people question, how do you do Christian counseling? And so, um, and I began to pray and God began to show me, I actually, I want to say it was 10 years ago. Now I sat down with um, Dr. Tommy Smith, who was also a counselor with um, Pathways for many years. It's retired from our agency now. And, and he just explained options for um, what a Christian counselor does and, and how I would pursue that. And through that, God used, used that to um, point me to the um, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And um, it was there that I learned more about implementing my faith into counseling and how that works. I also met my husband while I was there. We've been married for four years now. Um, we've been back in Alabama now for four years and live over in the Ozark area. Um, he is a student pastor, and so we've been doing um, youth ministry now for several years as well, even starting back in New Orleans, uh, working at a church plant, doing children and youth ministry. And so we, can, we still continue to do that today and enjoy that. Um, we don't have any children, but we have a dog. And he keeps us busy, and he's our baby right now. But just thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. So, uh, Jen, what church plant did you work with in uh, New Orleans? It was called Level Ground. Um, it was a church plant there um, with uh, other people from the seminary. And um, so were you involved with, um, with BCM at Troy? Um, I, a little bit. I was more involved with campus outreach. That's another okay. ministry that's there on yeah. that campus, but did participate in some of the BCM um, activities. Yeah. All right. Just, um, I, just, I, I was just going to uh, make a snide remark about Brad there, but never mind. Just ignore me for that. Okay. So, so appreciate that. Thank you all for, for sharing that. I'd like to uh, transition to uh, that, that subject of how to integrate the, the, 
secular counseling principles, secular counseling techniques, concepts, how they can mesh with biblical perspectives, how you use both in your practices. I, I have a, a, a way of, of describing how I believe this can work together, but um, you guys are the experts. And so uh, Alicia, take a shot at that. And then uh, when you're done, we'll let Derek and Jen also take a shot at how you integrate the biblical and spiritual with the, the secular. Um, well, I have a little bit of diverse counseling background in secular. I worked with the local mental health center as well um, as Derek, and I also worked with um, the, in the field of addictions too. Um, I worked in an acute psychiatric setting, uh, working with dual diagnosis, with serious mental illness, and with um, substance abuse. So those were secular settings, and so I, I felt very... Um, um, I felt unable really to be able to integrate my Christian beliefs and backgrounds and principles in those settings. And so once I moved into a ministry setting, it was really having that educational background and the principles and theories that come from my education, but also being a Christian and having the biblical basis and foundation because I have a religion minor. I have those biblical concepts. Um, I use scripture throughout um, my counseling. Um, it really does line up with a lot of the theories that I learned in my education. Um, for instance, cognitive behavioral therapy is an approach I use oftentimes. Um, I can integrate a lot of biblical scriptures, which is the blueprint of the strategies that we need for life and life issues. Um, I've been able to utilize that uh, with people that um, have self-esteem issues. You know, God tells us we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We were created in his image. Um, when we look at our identity, we want to look at our identity in Christ. And so when I work with teenagers, with children, with adults that have self-concept or self um esteem issues. We know those come from core beliefs. Well, we learned uh, and certainly in education regarding the core beliefs that come from trauma, abuse, dysfunctional families. And uh, we understand that, you know, those core beliefs need to be uh, founded in who we are in Christ. And so to be transformed and renewed, I mean, our mind uh, certainly is backed up in research and physiolog you know, physiological background with our brain. Um, God created our brain very complex, and so to integrate science and psychology and um, the Bible, I think um, I think they integrate well. And I've been able to. I've been in the ministry 20 years in counseling. I was in about I don't know maybe seven years roughly in secular counseling. So I have much more of a freedom as I sit as a Christian counselor and face people with different issues to know that God's working in me and through me to provide and tailor a good treatment plan for them. Um, and the approaches that I use, I, I use a lot of different theoretical approaches, but I really try to meet the needs of the person in front of me and tailor that plan and those theories and techniques around the issues they bring to counseling. So that's so how that works for me. Yeah. So obviously you, you don't think there is an inherent conflict between spirituality, biblical perspectives, and, and counseling. I think they can integrate in such a way, uh, the foundation is spiritual. And I think that there's a lot of uh, psychological principles, theories, techniques that um, scripture certainly is the foundation of. I think we can integrate that well. All right, very good. Uh, Derek, you wanna take a shot at that? Sure, um, my, my approach, uh, because I'm, I, I'm offer my doors to the public. Um, I have to be a little more user friendly. Um, I will say, um, I never compromise who I am. Like like Alicia, you know, I, I use a lot of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and as she stated very well, you know, there's a lot of very sound biblical foundations to those to a lot of those uh, techniques. Um, I'll give you a specific example. I'm, I'm trained in EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is a very secular um, technique um, related to moving your eyes as you revisit traumatic events. However, it has its roots in 
not being fearful, which we know is a very biblical concept. And by working with the client to revisit their trauma, they learn that they don't have to be afraid of their past. And that's a very biblical foundation type of, of example of what Alicia's talking about, that they're, I don't see a conflict. I think I think many times the um, uh, some of our our colleagues in higher education, uh, you know, they want to uh, make sure that we don't bring religion and faith and and impose that on others, which you know is is one of the foundations of chaplaincy that we don't uh, you know force someone to receive what what we have. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we can't offer what we do have if they do want it. And so you will find me praying with my clients. You'll find me sharing scripture. You will find me doing none of that, just depending on who that is in front of me. Because, you know, my responsibility is to that client. And just last week, I had a lady in my office and she's on local church staff. And when she found out my background as a minister and a chaplain, you thought the weight of the world fell off her shoulders because she was so relieved that somebody understands the journey she's on uh, from her perspective. And so I find that I, I find it more often than not that the majority of people that I see are relieved when they find out my background and are just thrilled that I and bringing that side, that spiritual, that biblical concept um, to the, the techniques that I'm using. So um, again, I say Derek, Derek is a National Guard chaplain with, alongside me. He's gonna be helping me next week with a, uh, some training we're doing for our chaplains. He's gonna do a, a session on uh, recovery from PTSD and also um, dealing with um, moral injury. Yeah, that was it. So. Uh, he's going to help me with that next week and I'm looking forward to his, uh, his, his training. He's done that, um, training event for some, uh, folks in his unit and had some good results with that. And so we're looking to help our chaplains be a little better equipped as well. So Derek, looking forward to that next week. And thank you for sharing. Now, for those who are watching on Facebook and you have turned tuned in late, as you say, uh, we are recording this, um, uh, conversation and we will be placing this on our website here uh, in the days to come as soon as I can edit it and get it on the website. So if you um, miss something, you can go back there and, and watch the whole thing. So uh, Jen, what about you? Talk about how you integrate faith and, um, and, and sector te counseling technique. Yes. And I just want to echo both Derek and Alicia um, with what what they have already said and i just know as christian counselors we view we view the bible as the ultimate authority to even be able to understand human nature and so i think when you have established the word of god as the um as the absolute truth you know we have a better foundation i think to sometimes even understand what could be going on in someone's life and heart and I think, and so I do, I pull things from secular counseling models that I see do benefit clients and then also can align with scripture. Um, we actually had a seminary class and I want to say it was our um, family systems class where each week we looked at a secular counseling model. And from there, we were able to pull out the biblical truth from that model. Now, not every detail of the model is going to align with scripture. Um, Rarely you will find a secular model of scripture that acknowledges the Bible as the absolute truth. You're just not going to find that. Um, a lot of the models also have no recognition of sin or a sin nature. So I would say that's another conflict there that we as Christians would have with the secular model. And we know that that's also very clear in scripture. And, you know, a lot of times we'll come up in, in our counseling room as, as people dealing with, you know, um, issues in their life that could be sin related. So I feel like those are several things, but there's also really good things that come from these models, like um, Alicia and Derek have already mentioned, just um, good things like a lot of the models will point out that um, 
setting structure and boundaries in a home. A lot of the models will point out that, you know, deep down every person um, wants to be loved and, and a value for human life. You see that in some of the models. And we know that that also um, aligns with scripture. So I think there is a way for us to implement this research that we receive from secular models to be able to apply it to even Christians who walk into our counseling setting. So it's definitely doable. You know, the way, the way I like to put it is we, we know God created the world and he, he created us and he created our minds and our, our, uh, our bodies. He, he created all of this to work in a certain way. And the foundation of modern science really is observing nature. I mean, um, uh, you know, a long time ago, centuries ago, there were people who didn't understand nature, didn't understand that nature had patterns, it didn't have uh, consistency. And uh, when you place a Christian viewpoint on, on nature, you know that if God created the world, and God is a God of order. He created it in an orderly way. He created it with rules. He created it to work a certain way. So, so just because a, an airplane is a secular invention doesn't mean I'm not going to fly in an airplane. I'm, you know, right now I'm not flying anywhere, but this is middle of COVID-19. But, but, you know, you know, just same way was autom automobile, you know, uh, automobile is a secular invention but it was created out of knowing that the world works in a certain way. That if you, if you mix uh, uh, petroleum products and air at a certain density and then a ratio, and then you put a spark to it, you know, there is a flame. That flame can be used to push a piston and that piston can be used to push a crankshaft, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we, we don't have any problem using it in other realms and I, I see there's no reason again why we can't use it um, with Christians and we, with non-Christians as, as Derek does. Uh, there are a lot of things I believe as you say in the counseling practice or counseling techniques that, that can be very biblical um, and, and because they are, we observe these things in nature. We observe the way people's minds work so it, and they work that way because God created them that way. So. Um, Alicia, take this, uh, tell me about some of the counseling philosophies and techniques you use. You've already mentioned one or two, but, but talk about some of the things that you use. Now, obviously, counselors are bound by a uh, confidentiality, and Derek is bound by privilege, too, as a, as a minister. Uh, but, um, you, so you can't talk about individual cases, I know. But what are the things that, uh, what are the counseling techniques you use maybe with a group of of people, not a group in terms of group counseling, but in an age group, or what are just different philosophies and, and techniques you use in your practice? Well, I think it depends on, like you said, the person, and while we can't discuss individual cases, I would think a lot of times, you know, with children, we have um, play therapy. I'm not a registered play therapist. However, we do the play therapy model, model and we will use art therapy. We will use activities and games that are geared towards child-centered and client-centered therapy. Um, oftentimes, certainly what we know is that's children's language as a way to discuss trauma and to deal with issues that are just hard to sit on the couch and talk about. We do that better, certainly with adults. And so I, I particularly like the sand tray um, therapy with children. Um, it's creating um, images with figurines in the sand, very typical to a drawing, but it's hands-on. And so children like to feel things. They're tactile and they like to be able to run their fingers through the sand. Uh, so there's a lot of sensory kind of things that go on there. Um, it's calming, it's soothing, uh, helps regulate emotions, I think, for children. Um, and it's a way to just be expressive of the trauma they've been through, the hard places they've gone through. Um, working with children of divorce, I was a child of divorce, so that is part of um, a passion for me. And in our society today, with so many broken homes and so many absent fathers, um, working with children of divorce has been uh, something that I have been thankful and blessed to be a part of. Um, and children are oftentimes in the middle. So I will also do a lot of psychoeducation. I will work with parents on co-parenting as well as parenting strategies. So I do a lot of psychoeducation 
Um, I think in that um, I will give, um, I do bibliotherapy, which is oftentimes using uh, children's books that will help you to process um, feelings and things that you've been through in a very kid-friendly way. Um, it's not very intimidating um, and it's a really safe setting. Uh, so those are some of the children uh, philosophies, techniques and so forth. Um, I do a lot of pre-marriage and marriage counseling. I'm um, certified in prepare and rich inventory. Um, that is a um, tool that we use for um, marriage as well as pre-marriage counseling. Um, and its division is um, um, very specific to the age, whether it's a uh, new marriage or a blended family, a second marriage where you have children involved. Um, uh, I also work with blended families, so I like a lot of um, Ron Dill's work uh, with blending families and, and um, again, helping parents to learn to, um, I think, merge a family and become one in that family. Um, with adults, ad ad adults come to me a lot of times with different um, issues. Um, certainly sometimes there's issues with um, infidelity, with uh, trust issues, um, sometimes uh, lack of communication. So we do a lot of strategies and skills in that. I do a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy. I like timelines. I like to do history uh, to really get a good working history. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, we can work a lot with where, where are your core beliefs? Where is your family of origin? And you know where you've come from is very applicable to how you behave in your present. Um, family relationships um, tell a lot. And so we will do sometimes genograms and family maps. So lots of different counseling techniques. And really, again, it goes back to tailoring those techniques to the particular person that's in front of you, assessing their needs well, developing a good treatment plan, and then integrating those strategies and philosophies and techniques that will work well for them. Uh, and I think both you and Jen, uh, uh, Jen, do a fair amount of uh, anger management as well. We do. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of times I'll do a lot of reality therapy there. Uh, <laughs> because I have an addictions background, I do have that um, from an inpatient and an outpatient perspective and setting. Um, there's a lot of confrontation that you have to balance, certainly with being compassionate and sensitive too. But a lot of times, it, and again, it's psychoeducation, looking at the 12 steps, which are very, um, very, um, I think, integrative in terms of, of the found, spiritual foundation that comes from 12 steps. And so you certainly can integrate that well. Um, with anger management, there's that anger cycle, and it's an addictive cycle, and it goes to a place of rage, out of control anger. And so to be able to teach strategies and skills and confront um, is, um, it is a balance. And sometimes you have people that will walk out, but I have most that tend to come back. But uh, so I think it's, it's being um, safe. I think one of the biggest things in a counseling session is your safety and establishing rapport um, and that client being able to trust you to go in very difficult places. Um, and so, anger management is one that you have to be, because you have some that are court ordered. So they're not really wanting to be there oftentimes. So it really is important in those few first few sessions to really engage well, establish a good rapport and give them some hope in succeeding and getting past the court dates and getting past a place of, you know, repairing damage and restoring a marriage. Oftentimes it comes out of a domestic violence or a marriage situation. So um, a lot of brokenness. And so just being there to help them in their place of brokenness. And God certainly offered a way for us in our place of brokenness. And I think we should, as Christian counselors, be available to do that for people. Good deal. Thank you. Uh, Derek, what about you? You've already, again, like, like Alicia, you've mentioned a couple of different techniques already. But uh, want, you want to unpack those or just talk about some other ones? Go ahead. I'd like to speak, I think, to context of, of counseling. Um, I, I have an office that clients come to, you know, traditional office. Um, but I also do a lot of the part work for Department of Human Resources. And um, 
given the fact and that I am a male uh, in the field, which is unusual, uh, we're in the minority, um, and given the fact that uh, I have a military background, um, I know how to be in, get to the heart of a matter, we'll put it that way. And um, I usually end up getting some of the knuckleheads um, that they have. Um, I get a lot of the men that are being difficult and um, I end up, um, they either come on board and see the light or I write a letter to the judge. And it just, it, it I'm a very black and white. I've got a strong gift of prophecy. Um, that's who I am. And I just don't play games with them. Uh, several weeks ago, I had a gentleman uh, call me racist. And then I gave him a chance to clarify that. And he reiterated again. I got up, showed him the door and wished him well and wrote a letter to the judge that said we're all racist, according to him. And that was his quote. So I'm sure that's not going to work out well for him come court date. But that's some tough love that he needs. And he needs to understand boundaries and those kinds of things. Um, I also enjoy uh, the DHR work because it enables me to go in and really impact the lives of children. Um, I have on numerous occasions have been called to go to a school to see a child. I get to the school and find out what's going on in the home and I leave and go straight to DHR and the child's in DHR custody before school's out. That has happened on about four or five occasions. And that's very fulfilling for me because those children are in terrible abusive situations. And given who God has made me and wired me, I'm able to go and just be that strong prophet and just call it like it is and make, try and make some things happen to take care of my clients or just the opposite, to kind of give them what they deserve if they want to, if they just don't want to, uh, to really work through their issues, then that's fine. We can, if you're in the court system, we can help you not work through it, and, but you may lose custody, you may lose visitation, you may lose all those things. So um, I would say for me, in addition to the, to the techniques we've already discussed, it's, it's also about being who I am. And I have found through counseling that I can be who I am, probably more so than I could when I was full-time minister. Um, much more um, freedom to be who I am, and it's okay. And, you know, if I, if I lose a client and, and don't get paid, that's okay. Uh, you know, God will provide that in another way. Eric, thank you. Appreciate that. That that is a little bit of a of a different um, take on things than a lot of counselors would have, I think. And uh, but that's okay. That's okay. You you have to do what uh, God is calling you to do. And uh, again, you might be able to speak into someone's lives a little more directly that way than than with more with a more conventional technique. So I I see what you're doing. Yeah. Don't hear me say that. You know I, I'm. I, I don't have the, the other side too. Um, but I wanted to make sure that side is there. I want to make sure that in this forum and this discussion that you hear that aspect of who I am. Um, and, and it has been very, it's a lot like being in the military at that point. It's been very satisfying to be able and freeing to be able to be who God has made me loving my client, trying to help them. But if they're not going to, to receive the help that's offered, then there are consequences for that. And um, so don't hear me say I don't have the other because I, I couldn't stay in the field if I didn't. Oh, I, I understand totally. And I also understand the term knucklehead. I, but anyway, we can, we'll define that later. Never mind. But yeah, uh, Jen, uh, is your, is your background from seminary in family therapy or clinical family uh, clinical counseling? Um, my master's is 
family and marriage counseling. And even since I've graduated from the program, I think they've even added a few more um, master counseling degrees, specifically a clinical one. I don't think that one was there um, when I was a student there, but mine's just family and marriage counseling. Yeah, but with family therapy, um, there is a, a difference between that and in some ways than, than, than a community agency kind of counseling, right? Yeah, there, there is a difference as far as how we work with families. There's a whole different aspect to that. There's a whole different look and treatment plan when it comes to dealing with families and the timing of that and when to even bring in certain members of the family and when you think that's necessary. So that it is different than just one-on-one. So um, tell me, tell us a little bit more about the kind of uh, therapies you use, the kind of counseling techniques. Um, it is interesting. You've got, we've got really three very different sort of, not extremely different, but three different perspectives here. I think it's interesting. So talk, talk a little bit more about your, about, uh, about your techniques and your philosophy. Sure. Um, I echo um, Derek and Alicia again with just a lot of, um, of the same techniques and therapy models that they use. Um, I know that me and Alicia also work with children that are in foster care um, through DHR and um, Pathways Professional Counseling is actually a sister ministry to the Alabama Baptist Children's Home. And I would say that probably at least half of my clientele consists of foster children or children that have been adopted. And so I've been trained to do um, TheraPlay, which is an attachment-based model to help children and families be able to bond. Um, we just know that when a child has been in foster care, they have been subjected to lots of different traumas in their life. And we know that trauma rewires the brain. And so this is a type of therapy and model that helps parents not only learn about um, the effects of the brain, but help to um, connect and bond with their child so their child can begin to learn to know what it's like to develop a healthy re relationship and, and to be able to trust. Um, and so, and to watch them utterly heal, you know, from that trauma. Um, and that's very hands-on. It's a very, um, um, parent and child are both in the room during this type of therapy where it looks silly from the outside, but it's really very much just a bonding process of teaching them um, to things to do together and along with setting boundaries in that room. Um, and so we also implement with our agency the TBRI principles, which stand for Trust-Based Relationship Intervention. And this is very similar to, to giving parents a great tool to help them understand a developing brain, especially a brain that's been impacted by trauma, just to know that, you know, parenting might look different for this child because of what they've, they've come through. And so I think, you know, at Pathways, it's really important that we um, are aware of these resources and are able to offer them to parents because it's definitely a challenge, especially, you know, taking in a foster child and, just um, there's a lot to learn with that as well. So that's one of the main things that I also work with in my counseling population. So um, Jen, you and Alicia both work for, again, Pathways Christian Counseling. That No, is that the name? Pathways, Pathways Professional. Professional. Mm -hmm. Professional. Pathways Professional Counseling. And uh, you both have offices. Um, you're on, in our office uh, in, in Coding County on Tuesday. Alicia's in on Wednesday, and y'all sort of have a traveling road show in the southeast part of uh, Alabama. But um, let's, let me let you just sort of describe the ministry of Pathways and then, um, you know, fee structure, how you get an appointment, all that kind of stuff. From, and, and again, you can talk more about, the, about Pathways or about the children's home ministry as well, whatever you want to do. But talk about Pathways for us, Jen. Sure. Um, Pathways Professional Counseling, we are a Christian counseling agency. Um, we actually have counselors that will um, do counseling throughout the state. We partner with different associations like, like you, Brother Otis. Um, me and Alicia come to the Covington Baptist office at least one day a week, and I'm sure Alicia can tell you more about how she travels to several of those offices throughout the week. I would say majority of the counselors with our agency um, do travel at least one day a week. 
but we offer a, um, a, a, a wide variety of resources for our clientele. We work with adults, children, teens, and couples as far as working when we cover a wide, a wide variety of, of issues, you know, including anxiety, depression, OCD, marital, spiritual issues, grief and loss, um, self-esteem, um, like I said, and, and we've, we've got counselors that really will specialize in a lot of those different areas too. Um, but to make an appointment with us, um, we actually have a website. You can visit our website at pathwaysprofessional.org. There, um, you can, um, we will get the information depending on where you're located in the state. Um, we have our admin assistants that are able to connect you with a counselor that would be closest to your area. And, but a lot of times people that are familiar with our area will call a local office um, to be able to make those appointments with us. Um, and we actually work with people a lot of different ways financially. Um, we are able to file on some insurances, but if not, we also offer a private pay option and also have a sliding fee scale that's income based. Um, we don't want anyone to be turned away for financial reasons. And, and we are able to do that because we are a nonprofit and we want people to come get um, the help that they need. And, um, and you guys uh, touch and Tommy Smith was, again, I know Tommy, Tommy Smith uh, was a longtime counselor in our office. Um, and actually, Jen, you took his place sort of uh, when he left. He was on Mondays. But anyway, that's not it. And anyway, and Tommy was a retired uh, Army Reserve chaplain. He was a, a Desert Storm veteran. So uh, good guy. I really appreciated him. But, um, you know. Um, just to, that to something just a second. When I was a, a local pastor and struggling, um, I, I want to mentioned that Pathways was there for me and my family. Um, they saw me um, through some really difficult times. I saw Rod Campbell, who works in the Oxford office, a uh, little short, bald-headed guy, but he was very, very great uh, for me and my family. So, you know, if any of your church staff is going through some really difficult times, these folks are a great resource to tap into. And as I recall, it was free for me. Now, that was years ago. But uh, it was, they were awesome uh, for local church staff. Well, let me say, they, they uh, my understanding of Pathways is they don't, they try to find a way for everyone to get to the help they need. And also, they're a great resource for, well, Pathways and then a, a counselor like you, Derek, is a great resource for a pastor uh, of a church anyway. Um, a lot of people might not be comfortable of, uh, Un, um, uh, unburdening their souls about some very private stuff to someone they're going to see in the pulpit on Sunday and Wednesday night. And this kind of uh, ministry can really be not only to uh, the personal life of a pastor, but to the professional life of a pastor can be a great, tremendous resource. We, we uh, our pastors are, would be happy to help anyone they can, but I think the, the record is, is sort of, um, it's, a, it's sort of difficult for people to to talk about some really personal private stuff uh, in front of some of their pastors. And that's nothing, nothing wrong with their pastor. It's just um, the advantage that counselors have is you hear them, you get to, to work through their problems, but they don't have to see you on Sunday morning. And they don't have to be reminded sometimes of those problems on Sunday morning. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, very good. Thank you for that testimony, Derek. That's a uh, that's a good, uh, a, a good uh, advertisement for them, but also just a good idea for everyone to realize that Pathways and, and other agencies around the state are there for people, and they want to be there for people. They want to help them, and, and so um, it's, it's, um, it, they'll find a way to make that happen. So uh, now, Derek, you are, uh, by, in contrast, you're in private practice. You have your own practice. Do you have a partner? Do you work with other another counselor, what is, what, how do the mechanisms work with, with your uh, private practice? So in, in my office, I have my own business. I have New Day Counseling LLC is, is my business. And there are three, counting me, there are three counselors in our office. We all have our own separate business. We share expenses, essentially. We split the rent, we split, you know, the water bill, whatever, you know, expenses, paper, those kinds of things. 
we share those expenses. Um, now, some some counselors have you know a group practice where they're all there's several counselors under one business name, and they're at different pay scales depending on who owns or has the biggest part of the the responsibility. Um, in my office, um, you know, we we just kind of we're all three strong believers and we love working with each other and it 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 works very very well for us um, we even share some administrative help at times you know we just uh, kind of help each other do what we need to do but we all have our own separate practice we're just in the same office so you're almost like a cooperative um yes sir yeah. yes sir, that's correct do you uh, do you uh, sometimes help with another uh, another counselor's client that's in distress or something? You you work yes, out that also. Fact, um, um, one of my um, one of my colleagues in my office is is covering down for a a, a fellow uh, LPC counselor who is going through a really really difficult time. She will be not be able to see clients maybe for six months or a year, uh, given what she's going through. And um, my colleague has picked up a lot of her cases. And of course, one reason she did that was because hopefully she can give them back to this other colleague eventually. Uh, you know, so you don't, you, you got to be cautious that, you know, somebody will steal your clients and steal your income essentially. Um, but, you know, it, it, we, we don't do that with each other. We refer, we, you know, I, my, one of my colleagues in my office has given me several clients this week. I've got more availability than she does, and I would be may or may not be a better fit, but I can get them in quicker than she can. And so we we really work hand in hand. And the the, the lady I'm 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 thinking of she there's a lot of times she's not she prefers not to do marriage counseling. Of course, that doesn't bother me. Being a pastor, I've done that for years, so that's no big deal. Um, but a lot of times she'll take the lady and I'll take the man and then we'll eventually get them back together and do some of what Jim was talking about in terms of the, uh, the marriage and family type of, of, of model. And so we, we kind of split that up at times, depending on, on what's going on. Great. Good deal. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that counselors are structured, counseling is structured across the, the state, uh, and uh, again, two different kinds here, um, a, an agency, not particularly a nonprofit agency, and then, and then a, a, a private practice. And um, nobody gets into counseling for, for, to, make, to get rich, let me just say that. Um, but, you know, a laborers worth, worth their hire, and uh, we need to make sure that, they, um, that uh, we respect that also. And I'm probably approved for eight or 10 different insurances. Um, and just depending on the circumstances, I may do something very much like pathways. I may waive the copay depending on what the client's got going on. Um, so it, it just, for example, if I see a military, someone in the military, I don't ever charge them anything. Whatever I get, you know, from, from insurance is what I get. That's just how I do it. So it, I have a lot of a flexibility just because I work for myself. I can do it the way I want to do it. And you know, if it works for me and I can pay the bills, I'm good with it, but someone in my shoes, unlike Pathways, I, I, I'm going to have a lot more insurances that I can take because I, I need to be able to bill whoever walks in the door. If somebody walks in the door, I need to be able to try and see them. I need to be able to try and, and bill their insurance. In fact, there's a, a Christian insurance out that I've been looking at maybe trying to get. Uh, it's kind of a cooperative. I forget the name of it, but I'm looking at trying to get credential through them. So any insurance that is, is worth its salt, I'm going to try and get credentialed so that I can build that insurance just so I can continue to pay the bills. And then there are employee assistance programs as well. Um, a lot of employers will have uh, alongside their health insurance or maybe a part of their health insurance, but sometimes alongside the health insurance, they'll be able to um, uh, say pay for six or eight or whatever many sessions for a counselor and uh, then you know they 
they, they can help you get that counseling you need as well. So there's a lot of different ways that we can go about this. Um, again, for those uh, joining us on Facebook, if you just joined, uh, we are recording this session and it will be hung on our Covenant Baptist Association website uh, in the days to come, as soon as I can download it and edit it. So um, let's go back. We're going we're gonna to close this out and uh, like to go around the horn one more time with uh, starting with Alicia and, and talk about a particular challenge in uh, counseling today uh, in general or related to COVID-19. So is there a particular challenge that, uh, that you're working with or working through um, right now? Well, as you noticed, Brother Otis, I had trouble getting on this Zoom. So I will tell you, since I've been in this profession for quite some time, I am real good with in-person. So telehealth has been a challenge for me um, because I'm not so electronic savvy. Um, and anybody that knows me will tell you that. Um, so I will tell you that telehealth has been a very big challenge for me in this COVID-19 uh, virus pandemic. Um, also, I think, at least for me, it's been difficult to, even when we've moved back to in-person, um, while I understand the necessity of the mask for a counselor, that can be a real barrier. Um, you know, almost like counseling behind a desk, so to speak. But um, so I'm not sure how long this will be going on, but um, I hope that there are some future strategies that can be available so I can see facial expressions and people can see my facial. So I guess I just do better assessing and engaging and rapport building if I can see your face, not just your eyes. So um, although the eyes you know, tell you a lot, so I think for me, that's a big challenge in relation to COVID-19. Um, also, I think um, particularly because I am, um, I have a passion and a heart for grief and loss. Um, and I sit with a lot of people with loss issues. Um, I get a lot of hospice referrals. Um, um, oftentimes um, I will get uh, referrals from pastors, um, and, and loss doesn't have to be just through death. And I've had a lot of losses that have come through other means other than just death. But um, I think it's particularly challenging for me um, sitting with someone um, and their loss issues because uh, it's such a sensitive place to go with somebody um, in their relationship with someone uh, that they loved and cared for and the loss that they've experienced and kind of walking them through that grief journey. Um, I tend to be a very sensitive person. And so in my tender heart, oftentimes I'm challenged to stay the course with someone with grief and loss issues because it takes a period of time to work with that population. And there's so much loss out there today. Um, loss even through the COVID-19. Um, I've experienced personal loss as well as set with people um, in counseling, even in this COVID-19 that have lost loved ones through the COVID-19. So um, I think those are a couple of, I probably could share more, but those are a couple that kind of come to mind. Um, Teenagers, I think, for me, are a challenge um, because I think teenagers face far more than we realize um, in today's time. And society um, is certainly far different from when I was a teenager. <laughs> and um, so the challenges I think that teenagers face, especially with the heightened suicide rate among teens, um, and counseling teens in very, very hard places um, with very low self-esteem issues and with teasing and bullying issues that happen not only on um, the internet, but certainly in person as well. Those are some of the things that kind of just come to mind and heart for me that I think are challenging at this time in our society. Well, thank you for that. I, I, the thing about the masks is, is I, I think the masks are working. I, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't play one on TV, but <laughs> they seem to be working. Things are getting better. But when I meet someone at Walmart or at the post office, I'm, I smile at them. And then, then I think they can't see my smile. So anyway, I guess they can see my, my eyes. So. You can smile. Well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. 
So Derek, uh, what about you? What are some challenges in these days for counseling for you? Um, I guess the biggest challenge for me has just been the, the, the drop in workload. Um, I have a, a, a contract with the local board of ed well, two board of education locally. And when the schools quit meeting, boy, that was gone. And that all, that always happens every summer, but that's no big deal. You know, that's just two and a half months, three months, but now we've had a six month summer. And so that's, that's been a challenge uh, for us uh, financially. Um, my, I have found that even back in the spring when things were shutting down and locking down, most of my clients preferred to continue to see me face to face. Um, and I was, because I own my own practice, I can set the rules and, you know, we're smart, you know, we keep our distance and, you know, we're not, I'm a hugger. So I've tried not to do that. Um, but I keep seeing folks, if they want to come in the office, come in the office. Now I had the virus back. Um, I contracted it uh, really the first two weeks of July and that put me down for a couple of weeks. Um, and so coming out of that, I'm kind of bulletproof right now for a while. We're not sure how long, um, but I give clients the option, you know, um, I get, tell them, look, you know, if you, we need to wear a mask, we'll wear one. Uh, most say, no, I don't want to wear it. Let me get it off. And, and it's very liberating, I think, to, to come and, and have a place where they can kind of uh, leave their issues and, and leave the mask behind too. So I have worn it, uh, you know, when I'm out in public and those kinds of things, but in my office, very, very little. It's a small office. We don't have a lot of people in and out. And so that, that helps as well. Um, and nobody in the office got it other than me. So I feel good about how we managed it. Um, but I would say the, the loss, you know, the, the income drop has, has been a challenge for me. And, you know, the, the digital sessions I have done, I will say have not been as, as effective to, to, echo what Alicia is saying that they're just not there's just it's just different than when you're sitting in a room and you're just engaging someone you can you can see what their feet are doing you can see what their hands are doing and you just don't get that when you're doing a session like this so it, it is not as helpful but it it get, does get us through these kinds of times for folks who can't get out, for folks who are worried about that, um, you know, who have health issues that they shouldn't get out. Uh, it's a very effective tool to kind of keep them headed in the right direction. But the majority of my clients have chosen to come see me in, in my office without a mask. And we have continued to, to march forward with that. You know, Derek, I, I think um, I would say the same thing about worship. Worship online is a good stopgap. Um, it's better than not worship at all, but it is not like being in, in worship in person. And I have to be honest with you, I really think, really think we could have kept, um, kept on worshiping. I mean, um, and, and you know, we, we as a, you know, Romans 13 is a real thing. You know, we need to be subject to the government authorities, and, and I, I got that. Think, though, that um, truth be told, if we had social, done social distancing, had spread everybody out, had multiple worship services, I think we could have been worshiping very safely, um, uh, and I think it would have been much more effective. You know, folks who don't feel comfortable, we, they need the online option. The folks who are who are um, susceptible to illness, yeah, I, I, maybe this will keep people from coming to church with the flu too and spreading it. So that may help. Well, so I, I was not, I really wasn't sure we could contain it. I, I, I really, I, I just didn't know. Um, and I well, been, there's no there's no playbook for this thing. There's not. There's not. And I had I had gotten called to some extra duty at McClellan. And I had seen some of our units get sent home early because of their infection rate. I saw units that come home that had a 20, 25% infection rate. And I just thought, we're not going to slow this thing down. But then my unit did annual training. And I'm telling you, we did a good job. 
we we social distance when we could we couldn't most of the time or many other times and when we did, couldn't we were wearing our masks out in the halls we were wearing our masks in meetings and to my knowledge only one out of 150 got it and that's being close quarters for two weeks in one building and we, I'm very, I left annual training thinking, okay, we can do this. And so that echoes what you're saying. I think we could have all along if we had put these measures in place, but you know, nobody did. My wife works at a college in West Georgia and oh my gosh, you know, they're not, they're not being smart and it's spreading. Well, we are talking about college students. Anyway, never mind. Uh, yeah, um, there is no playbook for this, and um, we're all learning as we go. And I think we know more now than we did before. But uh, Jen, what what are some challenges you face? Uh, you've been hearing everybody else and her on for a little while, so you've had a chance to think. So I know you've got some really good ones to share, right? Well, actually, COVID nineteen has really thrown me for a loop as well. I just know that. It has taken a whole lot more planning, a whole lot more um, just work involved, especially when we um, started um, at home with telehealth. You know, we were quarantined for all those weeks. And, you know, Derek mentioned having clients drop off. Our clients dropped off majorly. Um, I would say um, I could barely get half the people that I saw in my caseload to come back in. It was and, and obviously counseling was not the priority. Everybody's everybody was just wanting to be home. Nobody wanted to talk or do anything. And everyone's schedule was just um, totally um, gone at that point. And so it has from just how people come in our office now, we have just set rules as far as when they come in. And yes, our, our agency requires that they wear a mask and we also wear a mask. And it's even just changed how I work with children. Um, right now, I'm not working with kids as young as I saw because that requires so much more hands-on with them. And, and to even do telehealth with children that are that young, I have... I'm used to having control in my office and structure and routine, but when they're on that computer screen and they jump under their table, I can't do anything about it. When they turn off their screen, I can't do anything about it. And so it really has left me at a loss and just even feeling limited at times to say, okay, what, how is this really helping? You know, so that has presented all types of challenges for us and, and continues to as still some people do not feel comfortable being seen in person. And, and I am very much to it in person, you know, I want to see your face, you know, I want to have that connection and I feel like it's, I'm thankful for our telehealth. I really am, but it has, it, it's harder to make those connections. And especially if your internet's glitchy and you don't know what they said, and then, you know, um, or there's a lag in the time and then you're waiting for them to respond and they are responded and then you respond at the same time. And it just creates all kind of awkwardness. So I think, I, I know like y'all, you've probably run into every situation imaginable as far as I, I don't know what to do on this end, but you know, at least we tried today and I end up picking up the phone and trying to call somebody cause I can't get it to work. So, and I want to yeah, say that, you're I'm somewhat about, tech savvy, you know, but with this, it has just thrown me for a loop. I'm telling you, it's been hard. Well, you're talking about the uh, internet being glitchy. Uh, I, 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 you know, you, you, you don't remember or don't understand or don't realize how many different objects you have in your house that are connected to the internet. Um, and so before I do one of these Zoom calls, I go and turn all my phones off, turn all my, turn my printer off, turn, and then, um, I, you know, my wife... <clears throat> was watching a movie um, through uh, Roku box and I had to ask her to stop that. And she graciously consented. Um, yes. I, I'm, I have to go see her after this, but we'll see how that works yeah. out. May but, need some help, Alicia, on Wednesday. Never mind. Yeah, but I do. I really have a whole lot of concerns. I don't think we've begun to see the extent of trauma this is going to cause for a lot of people as far as with anxiety and loneliness and depression. I think we just barely scratched the surface of how this is really going to affect people. Well, folks, I look, I appreciate you doing this. And, and of course, this is uh, something extra that y'all did. You're, you're taking time away from your evening to, uh, to come and meet with us. So I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead. You, you guys have been very, very kind. You've been very, 
um, uh, expressive and telling us about your counseling experience and backgrounds. Don't want to don't want to keep this going on. We could probably well preachers and counselors can talk for hours and hours and hours, but uh, we we need to go ahead and put pull this to a, a close so that so that you can go ahead about your business and um, uh, try to rest a little bit for tomorrow. So I. I really appreciate all three of you. Jen, you've been in our office for four years, really? Has it been that long? Yeah, it's been four years. Mm -hmm. In June, it was four years. Okay. I didn't know it was that long, but uh, we're glad to have you and Alicia both. And of course, I, I appreciate Derek. I've been working with him again for quite a while. And uh, uh, I'm going to retire in November, and he's going to soldier on uh, for quite a few more years. So. Um, and in fact, he may have a trip to a very hot and sandy place in, in the couple of years from now. So, uh, be praying for Derek and appreciate his, his work in, as a chaplain, as a pastor, and as a counselor as well. So thank you all for, for, uh, for, for this. And, uh, I'm going to, um, close us out with a word of prayer and then we'll, we will be in touch. Um, I will see you tomorrow, Jen, I, I assume, and, uh, Alicia on Wednesday and, I'll see Derek next week by Microsoft Teams, I guess. So let me, uh, let me pray for us and uh, then we'll, we'll close off our call. And then uh, there'll be a lag because the, uh, the Facebook is behind the Zoom call. So I got to make sure we're, we're off the Facebook before I close the Zoom call. So thanks again. And I appreciate each of you. Appreciate your time. And uh, again, for those on Facebook, if you just joined, uh, understand we will be we're recording this and it's going to be put on our uh covenant baptist association.org website here in the days to come soon whenever i can download it and edit it so let me pray for us and then uh, we'll we'll call it a night thank you lord for these who have come tonight to talk about christian counseling thank you father for the fact that we have christian counselors people who can take the well-proven well-vetted secular techniques and combine them with what we know to be truth, the absolute truth from your word, and to, to bring a synergistic effect to our lives that, that is a, a great benefit to us as we work with people, as, as we counsel with them. Father, we thank you for them that, uh, who, who do this as a, as a specialty, who have trained and, and um, been supervised not just the education, Father, but actually having someone supervise them during their, their many, many hours to qualify to be a professional counselor. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, their dedication. We thank you for the good work they're doing. We thank you for each one of them. We thank you, Father, that you empower us all through your Holy Spirit to do this good work together. So bless us now as we go from this place. And, uh, Father, thank you for providing the resources that we need to have that abundant life here on earth as we await the abundant life in the hereafter, as we see you face to face in heaven. God bless us now. Thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen.